I'd like to welcome everyone here today to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University and to our first forum of our spring 2011 season. I'm Jennifer Bernardi, the Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum, where the speakers in the audience can exercise their freedom of speech. Uh, thank you for joining us at WikiLeaks, OpenLeaks, and Our Right to Know. Uh, you'll see right now that we have our friend Herbert Snorrison. Herbert, you can wave if you can hear my voice. <laughs> He's Skyping in from Iceland. We're still trying to connect with Mr. Daniel Domscheitberg, and hopefully I'll be able to do that quickly. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank the forum's generous sponsors, including, among others, Altria, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and our partners at Suffolk University, which serves as the forum's home base. We also thank our members, uh, without whose generosity we would never be able to put on the fabulous Fort Hall Forum. I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Wendy Ballinger. Wendy is the principal of Ballinger Consulting, a nonprofit development and organizational consulting firm. Her experience includes a decade of service as the executive director of the Ford Hall Forum, uh, as well as staff positions in both the Massachusetts State Senate and the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Wendy is the co-author of How the Press Affects Federal Policymaking with Martin Linsky, Jonathan Moore, and David Whitman. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Tufts University, and she is currently the treasurer of the Fort Hall Forum Board. Please give a warm welcome to Wendy Ballinger. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> Uh, it is a pleasure to be here this morning and to introduce our speaker, who is almost literally half a world away. Uh, Herbert Snorrison became involved. <laughs> Herbert Snorrison became involved with WikiLeaks first as an interested outsider, inviting Julian Assange and Daniel Domscheitberg to a meeting of the Icelandic Digital Freedom Society, with which he worked. That meeting led to much greater involvement, including his serving as a chat moderator for WikiLeaks in 2010. Snorrison is a graduate student, a historian, and an activist. He and Daniel Dom Scheitberg left WikiLeaks last year after disagreements with Assange on the direction and management of the web organization. They have founded a new site called OpenLeaks. According to its publicity material, OpenLeaks is dedicated to providing a safe pathway for whistleblowers to get their information into the hands of those who are in a position to publicize it. Not a publisher like WikiLeaks, but rather a platform from which the whistleblowers and the media and other organizations that want their information can come together. To explore not only the differences between WikiLeaks and OpenLeaks, but more importantly, the role such organizations and websites can and should play in a world that is becoming increasingly digital, I am happy to welcome Herbert Snorenson to the Fort Hall Forum stage via Skype. Would you like to open by talking a little bit about your experience at WikiLeaks and the creation of OpenLeaks? Well, there's not really that much to say. <laughs> uh, what I really prefer talking about is the ideology and the ideas behind these organizations. And I presume the questions will tend mostly to that. So, bring them on. OK. <laughs> um. In terms of ideology, can you talk a little bit about what these w websites, specifically OpenLeaks, are trying to accomplish in providing this pathway for whistleblowers? Since you talk about on the website that you don't verify the information, you simply provide a vehicle through which others can review it. The reason for that is that a single organization such as OpenLeaks or WikiLeaks cannot possibly have the resources needed to verify and authenticate every document that goes through the system. So it's uh, our thinking is that it's best to leave the verification to the media organizations receiving documents because they already have the expertise needed to verify the specific documents in question. So if there is a document pertaining to environmental issues, for example, Greenpeace is going to be much better at figuring out how to verify and authenticate the document than either WikiLeaks or OpenLeaks ever could be. Can you talk a little bit about how OpenLeaks, 
the site is in the process of becoming operational. Once it is operational, how do you envision it working? Uh, the system will function so that we will provide interfaces for the organizations participating in, this, in the system. So there will not be a submission interface on the OpenLeaks website, but instead there will be many submission interfaces on the websites of the organizations involved. So depending on the specifics of the situation, you may not even be aware that whatever you're submitting goes through OpenLeaks. That's Is part of the mission of OpenLeaks to protect the identity of whistleblowers? OpenLeaks does not make any editorial decisions with material that goes through, so that will be the responsibility of the receiving organizations. But we will press very hard for reductions of material of that sort, because simply this is not about endangering lives or helping parties in a conflict. Is that part of what um, what led you to found OpenLeaks, concerns about redactions in materials that were available on WikiLeaks? Not particularly, because redactions in WikiLeaks material have really not been necessary until very recently. Uh, it is more that we were disappointed with the management of the redactions that were performed by WikiLeaks. Uh, 15,000 documents were retained from the Afghan war diary for redaction. They were redacted, but have not to date been published. And this is one of the things that really led us to think that our purposes would not be served by working within WikiLeaks anymore. Can you talk a little bit about who Open leaks will be once you have all of your partners and members in place, or at least once you have a significant number on your website. Um, under the frequently asked questions, you note that who is open leaks is a question with various answers. Can you talk a little bit in more detail about who you'd like it to be? Well, there are various answers because, on the one hand, there is open leaks, the organization that maintains the technical infrastructure system. And on the other hand, there is OpenLeaks, the community around the system, which would include all the organizations that are participating in the system. We want to have as diverse a group as possible. So we want various NGOs, media organizations, basically anyone who has a reason to receive information anonymously and do something about it. And we want to have parties from around the world and what about the people who are maintaining the website? Unfortunately, there. Well, whoever is participating in the system and wants to come forward publicly can, but to date, only two of us have essentially shown any desire to do so. So, I really prefer at this point not to talk about the people involved, but there is a quite varied group of people. How can you measure, once the site is up and operational, how can you measure the effectiveness of open leaks? What are you trying to, I mean, what's the goal you're trying to accomplish and how do you decide whether you are accomplishing it? Well, our goal is to provide these services to as many organizations as we can. We're not specifically looking for some sort of global attention or media impact. We're, we would probably consider ourselves most successful if we manage to raise attention over this issue of whistleblowers needing protection and how increased access to information and lessened secrecy in how society works is a good thing. And in a way, what we, would, what we would hope to happen is to start an argument in society over where the boundary between openness and secrecy lies. And as at the moment, we think 
society is far too secretive. Although I know you and <clears throat> Daniel Don Scheiberg are located in Iceland and Germany, respectively, it sounds like the society you're talking about is American society. Mm, global society. Global society. I mean, uh, American society is particularly secretive, but if you take a look at the United Kingdom, it's not much better. And there have been motions, I mean, even in Iceland, to increase the secrecy of government operations. And this is something that we think needs to be resisted. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience shortly, so if people want to get in line, um, I think we'll give people an opportunity to ask you questions along with me. Um, <clears throat> When you talk about wanting to do this globally, though, the secrecy, do you see secrecy as something that's monolithic across countries, or are you trying to address it nation by nation where laws are different? It's, it's very diverse. In some cases, the sort of secrecy in question or the use of libel law to silence people is for instance, endemic in the UK. So that's a very peculiar concern there. But the use of copyright is essentially a global phenomenon. So it depends on the specific laws. It depends on the specific situation. Uh, secrecy is not a monolithic thing, but it's always, it's everywhere a similar thing. The specific means used to achieve secrecy are different. But it's still, you know, being secretive, not not wanting to let people know what's going on on the inside. Okay. Apparently, we're going to have a little bit of motion on the screen while <clears throat> you and I are talking. But you are talking about fundamentally the West and working in the West, where, for all that there are tremendous secrecy tremendous secrecy and laws that protect that secrecy, there are also laws that protect a certain degree of openness. How do, you, how do you plan to go ahead? Good, I'll see. <laughs> it's very difficult to operate in places like Russia and China. We aim to do that eventually, but there are certain difficulties that we need to, I mean, an organization of this sort needs to have a very stable uh, foundation before it takes on something like the corruption in Russia. That's basically the reason that the West is an easier place to operate. Mm -hmm. We first need to build a very solid base and once you build that face, you have, uh, you have belief that you might be able to start penetrating societies that are more difficult? Well, yes. I mean, part of it is the language barrier. There's really not that many people who, for instance, speak Russian well enough to understand the documents in question. So we need to seek out people in those places that are willing to cooperate with us, and that is a difficult task. <laughs> we have our first question from the audience, so I will cede the microphone for a minute. Hi. Is OpenLeaks going to be interested in revealing secrets of private organizations as well as governments? I recall WikiLeaks published some documents from the cult of Scientology, and they've been threatening to publish information about Bank of America, but they haven't done that so far. Uh, OpenLeaks does not have any editorial policy. So it's a question of what the organizations we'll be working with are interested in. I think it's safe to say that quite a number of journalistic organizations would be interested in materials about the banks. So openly, yeah, will probably be more focused on private organizations than governments, at least to begin with. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, 
Hi, good morning. Uh, as far as we know, uh, WikiLeaks or OpenLeaks or any other leaks have uh, closed their doors to uh, how the buildings, uh, the three towers, might have been brought down uh, on the events of 9-11. Were you any part of that decision-making process, and could you give us as much detail as possible about that subject? Well, quite frankly, there were never any documents relating to that issue published, so far as I know, or submitted to the WikiLeaks system. Uh, I have no objection to publishing such material if it is submitted. There was no decision made, as far as I'm aware. But isn't it true Julian Ansage uh, uh, categorically rejected all 9-11 related leaks? He may have. Uh, he has a tendency to be quite outspoken on issues that he feels strongly about. It, it may be that he suppressed some material, but I doubt it because quite simply, what, what WikiLeaks requires is documentary evidence. And although there is a lot of material pointing out inconsistencies in the official account and the like, there is really very little in the way of new documentary evidence relating to these events that could be published. But I mean, if anything appears, I don't think there would be any objection to publishing it. I'm going to jump in with a quick follow-up question. Are, is there any material that OpenLeaks would reject, since you're not in the business, of, you're not going to be in the business of verifying materials? Are there documents you would refuse to pass along? We will actually not be seeing the material before it is passed along. So the system is literally designed like the post office or the phone system. So we don't actually have the opportunity of rejecting material, uh, but we would probably break off relations with organizations that say published medical information frivolously or something of that sort. Uh, the privacy of individuals is something that needs to be balanced quite, it, it's on a knife's edge, but it's, it's very difficult to say in advance. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Are you concerned at all about your site being overwhelmed with misinformation, people putting out things uh, to uh, confuse people? That is obviously a possibility, but the thing is, OpenLeaks does not intend to publish information on its own site. We will simply be redirecting Document. So we will be handling the infrastructure for others who receive and publish information. Uh, it is possible the system will be used to spread misinformation, but uh, that really does not seem too likely to me because when you have a bunch of organizations that are interested in verifying the material, which we presume the participating organizations will be, it is really quite hard to get material, well, forgeries and the like, through such a filter. It's much easier if you build a direct trust relationship with someone in the media and just pass it along. I mean, in a way, breaking the link between the journalist and the source makes it harder to get this information into the media. So. Yeah. Thank you. That clarified it for me. Will there be any public access to op the OpenLeaks site? I mean, you're talking about using it as a conduit, but... We are considering how best to make that available. The problem is that the, the participating organizations will need to have access to quite sensitive parts of the infrastructure, and we cannot make that generally available, but we are considering options that would allow people, that would allow general access to the documents that we have in our system. Next question. Yeah, I guess that um, leads into my question is how or who 
has access in, in, to the information and is there any limit to what the information they have access to? So if you let some newspaper have access to information, do they have access to all the information? And how do you, how do you determine who, I assume, I understand you're just supporting the platform, but someone has to decide who, who has access to the information. I guess that was my question. Yeah, okay, so what we are doing is we will be providing a submission interface to each participating organization. <laughs> when sources go to this uh, submission interface, they have a choice whether they want to make the information available only to that organization or to the Open Leaks community in general. If they choose to let only that organization have access, then not even the people operating the system will be able to read the document in question. If they choose to give the community access, the original receiving organization will have some period, uh, what's the term? So they will have some period where they have exclusive access. So it is the source that chooses who gets access first, always. Go ahead, sir. There's a certain irony to the name Open Leaks and the concept of being an open platform and things starting from your ducking of the very first question that the moderator asked, um, why did you leave WikiLeaks? And fully understanding the uh, need to protect the identity of whistleblowers, that's another place where you're protecting information and it would seem, well, I'll leave it at ironical. I, I can, uh, to an extent, I can agree. Uh, the issue is not really that we don't intend to be completely open because that is simply not possible. Uh, what we aim to do is to be as open as possible without compromising the security of our sources. That, that sounds reminiscent of something that um, maybe George W. Bush or um, Stalin might have said about the information um, that they protect as well. Maybe I've overstated it, but there's a direction there. Well, I mean, I can't really say anything to make you trust me. Uh, we just have to try and prove by what we do that we can be trusted. I mean, that's, that's the only thing we can do. I'm sorry. Are you going to take any responsibility for verifying the identity of the whistleblowers or their legitimate access to the information they're providing you? Or are you going to solely leave that up to the people who are publishing it? Well, what we do is to completely obliterate any possibility of verifying the identity of the whistleblower. So the only thing that can be done is to verify the accuracy of the material. <laughs> you have a visitor. <laughs> Go ahead, next question. You mentioned uh, personal medical information as being uh, validly kept sec secret, but is there any class at all of government activity you would consider that it's appropriate to keep secret from the public? Personally, I am an anarchist. I don't believe government has the right to exist. Uh, so, in a sense, I think it's a good thing that OpenLeaks is not making editorial decisions about this. Uh, if information is legitimately causing risk to specific individuals, we will probably consider breaking off association with the organization publishing that material. But that is the only weapon or the only strategy that we would have in terms of preventing material from being published. It's prior restraint is not something that we ever considered implementing in this system. Let's move to um, a little bit bigger arena and talk about um, I'd like to go back to WikiLeaks for a minute and talk about, do you think the release of documents that's gone on over the last 
couple of years has had an impact on what's going on in the Middle East now? Well, ironically, the document, the set of documents that probably did the most to inflame things in Palestine were published by Al Jazeera without the participation of either WikiLeaks or anyone from that organization. Uh, it is quite possible that the release of the diplomatic cables has further inflamed the situation in the Middle East now. But to say that it's a result of that publication is taking things a bit far. Uh, the thing is, it's very difficult to say this release caused that. Of course. But it, it does contribute to an atmosphere. So when it becomes obvious that even the US State Department is not quite pleased with how things are going in countries like Tunisia, that does make people a little more willing to protest. I mean, who knows? Hi, I just wanted to make an announcement that I'm still desperately trying to get in touch with Daniel Domscheitberg and hope that he will be able to join us at some point. Uh, feel free to come up to the microphone if you have another question. Are you hopeful that OpenLeaks will, will have something of the same kind of collateral effect as these documents are released on governments around the world? Um. I don't think this sort of massive scale, both publicity and interest, is necessarily a good thing. It certainly has brought the subject to the attention of a great many people, but it's not, in my opinion, desirable in itself. Did we have another question? So Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about your uh, uh, inability or reluctance to verify. I'm going to take just a little case in the United States, which is important to some of us. There's a, 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 a reporter named Jim, last name Irish that I can't remember, who uh, did some interviews with NPR folks. But he basically took clips and mixed things together, which sounded, uh, came out really contrary to their views. And uh, uh, actually, the media didn't discover it, uh, except for, of all people, Glenn Beck. And uh, uh, you know, just the delivery of completely uh, false, whether it was a, a TV interview or a radio interview or a transcript, seems to be actually more damaging than releasing something that's real. So therefore, uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned about your, uh, uh, the, the, the process of non-verification uh, as perhaps negating some of the value of some of the material? Well, the question of verification and validation is essentially a question of work power. It is not within the ability of an organization like OpenLeaks to verify everything that goes through the system. That's just simply logistically not possible. Uh, I'm aware that it might lead to problems, and that is part of the reason that we have to be very attentive to what the organizations we'll be working with are doing. And essentially, we hope to be able to provide some sort of um, feedback procedure so that if an organization is doing something badly, the general public is able to let us know. Um, this is simply a field where you can't have a single solution. And this is one of the things that OpenLeaks is essentially experimenting with. We are trying to find out how this can be done. In our opinion, WikiLeaks did fail at this specific task. 
Go Good ahead. morning. What arrangements or directions um, do you have uh, with the participating organizations with respect to uh, uh, criteria for uh, uh, documents or uh, the potential for the um, uh, uplifting organization, I don't know the, the right web words, the uplifting organization uh, to verify uh, the, either the accuracy or the verisimilitude of the, uh, of the documents in question? It depends on what the organization is going to do. I mean, we probably expect media organizations to do a bit more work on that front than organizations that are simply receiving um, information that's not for publication. Uh, generally, the requirement is that there is a set of people who are dedicated to the task of verifying information and working with the information that goes through this system. Other than media organizations, uh, what other kinds of organizations uh, topically uh, uh, are uh, Open League's participants? At the moment, I can't really disclose, but I can say that <laughs> Certainly, some organizations that we would be very interested in working with would be, for instance, the ACLU, uh, Amnesty International, the International Com Committee of the Red Cross, Greenpeace, just there, to name, you know, the high-profile organizations. How many organizations uh, are you working with let, in the United States, for instance? At the moment, we're not working with any US-based organization. Uh, eventually, we will, we hope to be able to support about 100 organizations when the system is in full operation. Uh, some of those will almost definitely be US-based, but there's, we don't know who that would be yet. Thank you. morning. Um, first, it, it, it sounds like you've put together a very sophisticated organization, and, and for that I'd like to congratulate you. Um, but I, I would like to follow up on another audience member's question, um, in that it sounds like this organization is a highly secretive organization, um, with a lot of secrets, and I was wondering what separates your organization from other organizations? Why, um, to meet their own means, other organizations uh, for political reasons or for practical reasons, hold secrets or to protect people. Whereas when you do it, it seems to be okay. Well, okay. Um, at the moment, we are a little more secretive than we would like to be. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that we don't actually have our organizational structure in concrete, in concrete terms yet. When we do, that will be public, made visible to everyone. Uh, we are working on that front right now. So uh, a large part of the reason for this secrecy is that simply we don't have, we don't have anything to make public at the moment. Uh, there are about a dozen people involved with the organization at some level. Uh, only two of those have been willing to be named publicly in relation to it. So we respect the wishes of the others not to be named, but we actually would like for them to come out in the public because this is actually quite a lot of work for just two people. Hi, good morning. Um, in 1971, Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers to what seemed to be the open arms of the New York Times, um, the Washington Post, among others. When the Afghan War Diary was leaked, we saw a general reluctance from uh, the me media organizations throughout the United States. Uh, do you have any comment about that, about their reluctance to publish it or to investigate it further? 
And do you have any comment about what open leaks uh, might do to get this information to people? It's the case of Ellsberg is very interesting because he actually tried to get the material to a number of senators before he gave it to the media. Uh, what seems to have happened is that the senators were so heavily vested in the system at that time that they could not do anything about it. The media wasn't as involved in the political process at the time, or they weren't as let's say, tied to the political elite. Uh, what has happened since is that media organizations have become increasingly dependent on having this privileged access to the government. And one of the things that might actually be changed through systems like WikiLeaks and OpenLeaks is that it becomes far easier for organizations to get access to inside information, as it were, uh, without having to rely on people within the organization, within government willing to compromise their positions. So uh, this is a really big problem in general. It's actually larger in the United States than it is in most other places because there is a closer integration between the media and government than there is essentially anywhere else. It, it's, it, it's interesting to note that the difference between reporting on specifically the Afghan and the Iraq war logs between the organizations involved. So if you look at what The Guardian was saying and what Der Spiegel was saying, it's considerably more detailed than what was published by the New York Times. So essentially what needs to change in this is that basically people will have to start listening to voices from elsewhere. Al Jazeera English, for, for example. Do you have a question before I go on? Hi, good morning. Uh, I was wondering if you could unpack your philosophical view that government <clears throat> doesn't have a right to exist. I think we could all make rational arguments whether there should be more government or less government, but the idea of no government seems a bit extreme, and I was just wondering if you could uh, discuss that a little bit more. Well, there are quite a few books written by a number of anarchists throughout history. Uh, essentially, my position is that the only thing that government really does is to enable an elite to hold control over the rest of us, which is not the way things should be, in my opinion. Uh, services provided currently by the government can generally be provided in other ways, in particular, the security of persons and health, sorry, health insurance and that sort of thing can easily be provided in a more decentralized and distributed manner than it currently is. So, yeah, that is a topic that I could talk about for probably two hours, so. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have quite that long, but thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, where you envision OpenLeaks being five years from now, especially uh, in terms of the media you're talking about? Because when you talk about having things published, a lot of the time the media you're speaking about are old media, the New York Times, Der Spiegel, and they're under tremendous pressure um, financially and may or may not exist five or ten years from now. So who will your publishers be beyond advocacy groups? Well, five years from now is very difficult. I would not have envisioned myself where I am right now a year ago. Uh, the development that has happened with this entire 
sort of thing since the large revelations by WikiLeaks last year is immense. And at this point, it's really not possible to see where it will lead in the next year, let alone five years. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to work very fruitfully with the media. Uh, if not, then, well, there is an entire community of people committed to transparency and to openness uh, within the technology sphere, and they have, let's say, their ways and means of getting things into the public. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, that's me again. Um, I appreciate your uh, sincere uh, comments about the uh, uh, governments in general or their uh, right to exist, and we really appreciate that. And could you extend your, uh, again, sincere and bold comments in simple, plain English about the media and what is wrong with our American media, please? Well, it's not just American media. In general, uh, the media is reliant on easy access to information from government. This means that government has, in a way, the ability to get annoyed at the media, which makes them very, very sad. So essentially, what needs to be done is to disrupt the link, disrupt this need for a comfortable relationship between the media and government. That is one of the things that both WikiLeaks and OpenLeaks aim to do. Um, do we have any more? We don't have any more questions from the audience at the moment, so I will uh, use my prerogative and ask another question. Can you talk a little bit about the business model for OpenLeaks? I and mean, how are you going to support the platform, and yourself for that matter? Uh, Mainly, we expect to be able to support the system through donations, private donations. Uh, we would like it very much if participating organizations would fund parts of the infrastructure that they use. Uh, at the moment, we're actually not. So currently, we have the infrastructure system set up quite nicely, but we are lacking funds for personnel. Uh, but that is something that can be solved. I mean, there are quite a few people who are willing to support an enterprise like this, and that's their right, in my view. Will OpenLeaks be a non-profit enterprise or a for-profit company? Non-profit enterprise. There is, uh, there is no reason to make a profit on this sort of activity. And are you hoping to encourage others to create leak websites? Yes. Like OpenLeaks and... One of our main objectives is to build what we call a knowledge base that will detail the obstacles that we come across and our solutions to them. So how best to provide secure services of this kind and the like. Uh, our objective is to make sure that anyone who wants to help whistleblowers is able to do so. And are you concerned about um about liability to governments in creating the website. I mean, at the moment, you're on Skype, I understand, because in addition to the fact that you're located in Iceland, that you can't come into the United States. Well, that's mostly because I expect that I'm on a list of some sort that would cause delays on arrival. Okay. Uh, Jacob Applebaum, <laughs> a U.S. citizen, has been harassed every time he enters the United States since his association with the organization became public. Uh, I'm not worried about imprisonment or arrest or anything of that sort, but I prefer not to go through that sort of hassle. It's, 
I mean, it, it's pointless. Why? Why are people doing this? It's it's silly. But do you expect it to increase as OpenLeaks becomes a viable site and your responsibility for the for transmitting at least some of these documents presumably there's a legal liability at least from the United States point of view as you transmit documents that may be either secret in a corporate sense or secret in a government sense well that's part of the reason for the structure of open leaks um, what's the term Open Leaks is essentially functioning as a mere conduit in the telecommunications sense of that phrase. A common carrier? Essentially, yes. So in the same way as the USPS is not liable for, for delivering cocaine through the mail, it's fairly difficult to see how Open Leaks could be held liable for information passing through their system. Has the organization or enterprise, which you refer to as OpenLeaks, formed as a recognized entity under the uh, laws of, the, uh, of Iceland or uh, another um, um, state? Not at present, no. There is the intention of forming a foundation in Germany which would serve as a more general whistleblower protection organization. Uh, Open Leaks, as such, uh, does not at present require a legal existence. Uh, but if that becomes required, we will certainly look into how to do it. Your proposed foundation in Germany, would that be a private foundation, or would it have an existence recognized by the, um, the German state? Would it have to register? as, uh, let's say, not-for-profit enterprise or something of that sort? It would be a registered non-profit institution. Thank you. Go ahead. We're, I'm going to note that we only have about five minutes left. Is that right, John? Nine minutes. Sorry. Go ahead. Good morning. In earlier response, you mentioned the knife edge of your organization. How have you or will you define the line between secrecy and privacy? Well, I think it mostly needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, obviously, the health of a state minister has some relevance to the public. Uh, whether that would justify disclosing medical records is a different question. Uh, I mean, this is an extremely difficult subject, and I don't claim to have any definitive answer. I simply say that I stand for more openness than has been usual up until now. I don't think I would consider myself an advocate of total openness, but I, I can't define a line. It, it is, in every case, balancing on a knife's edge, as I said. And you're going to have to leave that balancing to the recipient organization, since you won't have the resources to pre-screen the data. I, I think, in many cases, we would we will have to leave the final decision to the receiving organization, yes. But we will probably participate in discussions about what is right and what is not, both in general and over specific issues that arise. On a slightly different subject and a difficult one, perhaps, for an anarchist, um, isn't it possible that a lot of the whistleblower information might be used effectively by government regulatory agencies? Um, environmental control issues such, that they might have more leverage than just the media? Will you be opening your recipient list to government organizations as well as NGOs? Well, there is no principle, I mean, there's no reason in principle that government organizations should not be allowed to be recipient organizations in this system. Uh, 
we have discussed it that it, we do not exclude government organizations from the possible participating organizations. Thank you. I know I have another one back here, sir. Question come on. Good morning. <clears throat> the organizations that serve, if you will, as your megaphones, the Der Spiegels and New York Times of the world, as the moderator has previously pointed out, themselves are facing challenges in terms of their own business models. And uh, we, we're hearing a great deal of recognition now of their own struggles to uh, survive in a world in which their, their former business models have, uh, are, are now in disarray. The <clears throat> kind of, and, and, and of course it seems, if we understand you correctly, that the work that you are doing does depend on the survival of those, uh, if you will, classic media type of organizations uh, in order to, to get the amplification that it seems that you intend. Now, the, the kind of information that you're making available to the world has several components or several aspects to it. One of those, of course, is a public good, and I assume that's the, the principal driver for your spending your time and what you're doing. There's also an element or a way in which certain types of information that will probably pass through your portals can be valuable if it's known to certain people but not known generally. This is a kind of a, if you will, a news-related counterpart to what we call uh, insider information, <coughs> insider trading in the, in the corporate context. Nobody likes that, of course, because it allows people to manipulate markets. But because news organizations are challenged in the way we've been talking about just yesterday, it was reported that uh, there's a challenge in, in dealing with uh, the, the glut of foreign news over the last few weeks because news organizations have shrunk because of these resource constraints, it strikes me that there is likely to arise somewhere uh, a, a level of viable subscription-based media type organizations whose uh, <clears throat> sustenance depends on more direct subscriptions such as you know internal business type newsletters uh, and for whom the public good component is, if you will, secondary to their existence. So the question is, to the extent that such organizations arise and actually have the ability to gain their sustenance from passing on information that you all would make available uh, to certain people but not all, in other words, to the subscribers but not all, would you be open to interacting with organizations of that kind? We would probably be open to working with organizations of that kind, yes. Uh, there would be a different set of constraints for them than for generally available publications. But I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is that the press throughout most of its existence has been dependent on subsidies, often from corporate owners from labor unions or something of that sort. That essentially is not something that is going to change. Uh, I, I don't think the press as we know it is going to go away, uh, but the specific funding models will probably have to change. And to the extent that a publication is made available anywhere, uh, the information in it does become available essentially everywhere. So, uh, yes, the specific words may not be readable by everyone, but it will be picked up by others and carried along through that route. So, I, I don't think organizations of that kind should be excluded either. Our last question of the morning. Um, for about 10 months now, uh, Private Bradley Manning has been detained in Quantico Bay um, in solitary confinement and what someone would con some would consider uh, torture for the alleged leak of various Iraqi war documents. 
what is it that separates OpenLeaks submission system from that of WikiLeaks and how it, will it protect future whistleblowers from the same consequences? It's okay. <laughs> Just to make it clear to begin with, I think that what's going on with Manny is absolutely atrocious and should never have happened. I also have to make it clear that Manning was not uncovered through a weakness of the WikiLeaks submission system. The allegation is that he had a conversation with a third party, which then revealed his identity to, I think, the FBI originally. This is something that cannot be prevented through any technical means. If you place your trust in someone who then sells you on, that is not something that you can do anything about. It probably needs to be made absolutely clear that we can only protect your identity if you don't tell anyone else that you have leaked or gotten submitted information through that system. But yeah, that's sorry mess. Well, that seems like a good note on which to end. We are <laughs> tremendously, <laughs> tremendously grateful to you for taking the time. And I'm going to turn this back over to Jen with, for, with a few closing notes. How about a big hand for Herbert? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us, Herbert. I'm sorry your friend Daniel couldn't be on here, but uh, more, more airtime for you, so thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. If you would like to become a member of the forum, we can certainly make that happen. Um, and I hope you come to the next forum. Thanks a lot. <laughs>